Well, I know you can't tell, but I lost 10 pounds yesterday. <laughs> Woohoo! Did a wedding out in 100 degree. It was actually a metal barn, so it was like an oven. And uh, I felt like a wood-fired pizza. And so I lost 10 pounds. Um, I ate watermelon, though, in the evening and gained it all back. So that's why you can't tell it's gone. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking about um, opening up with this line. This is not going to be an uplifting message today. But I thought, you know, as a public speaker, that's probably not the best way to start out. Um, but then I'm not really a public speaker. You know, I'm just a guy who's trying to follow Jesus and hoping you guys will follow him too. And so this will not be an uplifting message, okay? Um, in fact, if you, don't, if you don't walk out of here feeling a little bit lower than you walked in, I probably won't have done my job because I have struggled with this passage the entire week. And there's literally a point where I just say, okay, I'm not going to... I'm not going to teach any farther beyond this part of the passage because if I do, I'm just lying. I'm just faking it. And, and have you ever been in that place where you felt like you were, you were a faker, a poser? Um, have you ever, okay, this is funny. Have you ever been to one of those wax museums? It, uh, I can't remember. It's got a French name to it, but. Yes. You, you, heard, you heard it. Um, Anyway, you go in there, and literally the people look very, very much like real people, but they're not. They're wax. And at times, as I was reading this passage, I just thought, I'm just, I'm just a wax person. I'm not real. And, and so I hope you don't feel that way. Well, no, I might hope you feel this way after we get done with this. But um, we're in uh, Gospel of Mark, <clears throat> and we just got done with a passage where um, Jesus is trying to help his disciples and the, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the scribes. He's trying to help them understand who he's going to reach out to. He's going to reach out to absolutely everyone. There's no one left out of his plan. He wants to reach them all. He wants to help them understand the love that God has for them, that is shown to them through him, Jesus, and then hopefully through his disciples. But his disciples aren't really on board that well. And, and quite frankly, the, the teachers and the Pharisees, they're really not on board. So it's, it's difficult. It's difficult. So he's, he just got done with that. And then he got to a place where I think it was an object lesson. He dragged a guy outside of a city. He washed his eyes a little bit. Uh, the guy couldn't see very well. He saw people walking around like trees. And then he wiped his eyes a little bit more. And then he could see clearly. And so from, from my understanding, it's, it's helping the disciples see that they don't see quite clearly enough yet. And I really don't think they're ever going to start seeing clearly until after Jesus has gone to the cross, he's been raised to life, and the Holy Spirit's been poured out. Then they begin to go, oh, now we get it. And then even then, they'll fall into places where they, they start to drift away from his mission. So, so for us, I hopefully we, we go, okay, even if I drift away from his message, or even if I don't see him perfectly clear right now, I'm no different than the people who were following him, like literally following him in person. So let me read this passage. We're starting in uh, Mark chapter 8, verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. I mean, let's just stop there. Seriously? But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And I'll just read this little passage. It won't be up on the screen. He ended this little talk with, And he said to them, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. Okay, um, a little 
work here. Uh, turn to the person next to you and ask them what they think it means to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow Jesus. And we're going to do something over here because it's clicking and driving me a little bit insane. <laughs> so, so turn to the... And, um, is there a guitar player in the house? Hang on. Talk amongst yourselves, really. <laughs> you guys hear that? Can you get a beat? Can you turn something off? Kath Kathleen? <laughs> Kat, are you around? I was trying to read to the beat. Have you ever felt like you wanted a cadence and you're like I was rapping almost? Okay, we're just going to go on. Um, that's funny. <clears throat> so let's just, okay, that's, um, did, have I mentioned ever that I'm a little ADHD? And so, so that's going to annoy me. Ah, okay. Let's go, uh, let me, I'll show you a map here real quick. Je Jesus and disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. There's a little map here that tells you, shows you where Caesarea Philippi actually is. It is literally 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee, the place where we've been kind of hanging out. And where we just left, we were in Bethsaida when he dragged the guy out to show him, you know, that and the eyes were okay and then not okay and then he could see clearly. So uh, we're 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee, the area where he's been doing ministry for many, many months. And we've been kind of going through it since January about the ministry that he's been doing around the Sea of Galilee. And he goes up into Caesarea Philippi. Now, uh, we've kind of looked at the, the eastern coast of the Sea of Galilee is more uh, Gentile, more pagan. To the, the west is more Jewish. But when you go that far north, you have come into completely pagan areas. In fact, um, up there, one of the Herods lived and made his house there, and so there was a big temple to Augustus Caesar up there. There was also a really interesting place where the, the pagan gods lived, or they hung out. And uh, I've been there a number of times, I think three times I've been to this place. It's like it's one of my favorite places, but it's not. It's kind of disgusting and gross. There's this really big cave, and there's a lot of different niches where little statues used to be, and um, there's a picture of like what it may have looked like back in the day when... When Jesus would have gotten there, there were temples actually to these different gods, these pagan gods. And the pagan god that they really focused on up there was a guy named Pan. And if you see a picture of Pan, you kind of know what Christians have thought about Pan over the years. That's actually a rendition of the god Pan. And we often make the devil look like that, right? He's got horns. This guy um, has hoofed feet. He's like half man, half goat. And um, I'm trying to look around how young the people are in here. The things that they did in their religion were absolutely disgusting, okay? So you got Jewish people, right? Jewish kids for the most part. I mean, John would have been a younger kid in those days. And Jesus takes his disciples 25 miles on a journey up into this area, uh, Caesarea Philippi, where mostly it's all about pagan worship and disgusting stuff is going on, um, there was a movie years ago, like a like really long time ago. Only those of you who are 50 and above will ever remember this. Uh, it was called Dragnet the Movie. Anybody see that one? Dan Aykroyd and Tom Hanks. And they were like the Dragnet people from really, really long time ago. And they were going after this, this pastor guy who, who played the fence. He was the pastor on one side, like of the moral majority. And he was like the most self-righteous person in the world. But he also led the pagans. Pagan, P-A-G-A-N, people against goodness and normalcy. And that was his role, and he was the grand poobah, kind of put the pan mask on, and they put goat leggings, and they danced around, and there was a huge snake, and it was disgusting, and they were doing crazy, disgusting things. But I thought, if you would see that movie, you'd see how disgusting their religion was. It was just a horrible, horrible experience. And my understanding is that Jesus takes his disciples to this place and they would have, it would have been worse than Las Vegas. Like it would have been like into a club at Las Vegas. It would have been worse than that. And I mean, right, they're, they're high school boys. They're like, 
oh my gosh, did you see that? Did you? And Jesus is just taking them in there. Now, along the way, as they were walking up to Caesarea Philippi, he asked this question. Who do people, meaning not them, but who do people, you've been in the crowds, who do people say that I am? And Well, some say John the Baptist. I don't know how that's the case because like John the Baptist was alive during the time of Jesus, and so I don't know why they would say that. I guess they would say that he would have been, been reincarnated in some way. Others say Elijah, who's an Old Testament prophet, who obviously must have come back to life in the person of Jesus, and still others, one of the prophets. So, so they're kind of identifying Jesus with somebody who speaks for God, somebody who, who talks for God and is a prophet, somebody who, who is um, a voice you know, for, for God. And so that's where they, they think Jesus might be. And then he takes the question right to them. But what about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter answered. It's, it's plural. So the, the question was like to everybody, but Peter, like he often does, he just shoots it out, blows it out. You are the Christ. Boom. And for once, he was right. It's like, yes. Now, it's interesting because if you go to the Matthew's account of this, it's, it's just an interesting, he adds a little bit. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, if they're at Caesarea Philippi and they're watching all of this disgusting stuff taking place, or they're at least looking at the temples and going, this doesn't seem like worship like we do. Because we revere God, we love God, we, we, um, we're pure, we're holy before him, and these guys don't seem like they're doing anything good. They're, they're actually doing nasty stuff. Yeah, come on up. I got you. Yeah, buddy. thanks, man. What is it? It's this iPad right here. Okay, because I thought it was just keeping time, like, okay, the clock is ticking, man. Hurry up. Get done with this. Okay. Can you believe that she said that part? <laughs> like that was I, I don't think my craziness or lack thereof was in question before um, so these disciples are seeing this and Peter says you're the Christ the son of the living God everything we, else we see is dead here this is dead religion this is disgusting this is horrible but then it goes on <clears throat> Jesus and this is how a rabbi would talk to a, a disciple who finally got it right, who, who had an insight that was just better than what they could have come up with on their own. Mm, Peter, son of Jonah, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father in heaven. And I say to you, Peter, and you remember his name is Petra. It's, uh, it actually means rock. Petra, rock. On this rock... I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. You know the passage, right? It's in Matthew. It doesn't have it in Mark, but it, I think it sets a good stage for us to help understand what Jesus is now going to speak to his disciples. You see, it's funny. If you go back to the um, little cave thing, when I was there three times, every time the teacher would say, now, where the temple was was right in front of that, and Many years ago, there was an earthquake like in 1837 or something, but water used to pour out of that cave. And so the people would be there, and they would think that out of that cave came life from the gods, the god Pan. And, and they would descend into that place, into the underworld, and that's where they lived. And so they would think, literally, that was the gate to the underworld, the, the gate of Hades. So... Um, there are times when um, Catholics will say about this little passage where Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. They'll say, oh, on Peter, Peter the guy, Christ is going to build his church. And so that's why Peter was the first pope, and every pope has been kind of um, part of his line. And so um, they would say that Peter is the guy. He's on Peter, they're they're going to build, or Jesus is going to build his church. Evangelicals, Protestants like us, we would say, no, 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 it's not Peter himself, it's not the person, but his confession, right? I don't know if you've ever heard that. On, on Christ's confession, or on Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ, that we're going to build the church on. Now, I, and those might be true, and they probably are true. I think it's an important thing that we confess that Jesus is the Christ. But if you're there, 
And you are standing on basically a mountain that's been chiseled out, and it's all rock. And, and you know what they think of this place, that this is literally the gates to the underworld. And Jesus says, on this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of Hades will not stand against it. What do you think? Like, if I'm a disciple, I go, oh, let's not build it here. <laughs> this, is, this is not the place to build the church, Jesus. I mean, do you understand what they're doing? I can see what they're doing. If you ever Google pan and you see the images, you will you'll just go, no. And I'm guessing, like the disciples are even thinking and seeing these things and going, Jesus, don't do it, man. Don't do it here. This is the worst place. Um, I don't know if you know where uh, Mother Teresa had her little convent. There's a, a temple right next to her convent. And in her convent, they take care mostly of people who are dying of AIDS or who are dying. And uh, there's another group of people that they also take care of. And this is interesting. There's a place where um, they, they worship bulls. And so they bring the bulls in. And this is kind of disgusting. I'm going to look around. Okay, we've got some. Okay, just close yours, young people. Um, they bring a bull and they stick his head up on like a, a small altar. And the father will bring his children around the bull and he'll take a sledgehammer and, and keep on hitting the bull's head until all the blood runs over the children. Now, sometimes in the frenzy of that whole thing, the father will miss the bull and hit his children. Do you know who Mother Teresa took care of? Those kids. Now, in my head, when I'm thinking Jesus is going to build his church in a place that pagan worship is taking place, I think, wow, that's, that's pretty impressive right there. There was a song years ago, I mean years ago, and I don't even, I don't think I was a Christian when it came out, but it said something about there are some people who would like to go to church with the bells, you know, chiming and the beautiful chorus and choirs and the whole thing, but I'd rather set up camp about a, uh, a yard from the gates of hell. And, and I, I always think about that when, when I think of being in that place and, and maybe that Jesus was not saying, yes, on Peter I'm going to build my church, or on Peter's confession I'm going to build my church. No, no, I'm going to build my church really close to where some really disgusting things are taking place because that's where these people need me to be. And I think, wow, is it possible that we've missed a little bit, and especially in light of the teaching from last week, it's like Jesus is really stretching, going past the Jewish people, certainly past the, the holy Jewish people. Now he's included the kind of the yucky Jewish people, and now he's even including the, the yucky Gentiles, and now the, the yuckiest, most disgusting Gentiles he can find. And he's saying, that's where I'm going to build my church. Want to be a part of it? And, um, and at this point I go, uh, to be honest, I'm not sure. Because that seems like it's going to be very messy. D don't you think? Like, if that's really the case, if that's where Jesus wants us to be a involved in the lives of people, don't you think that be gets, becomes very ugly and, and disgusting? But, of course, Jesus warns them not to say anything about this. But it's not like he's hiding everything. He's, he's hiding, hey, don't tell anybody that I'm the Messiah yet, but i got to tell you something now. Now that you think that I'm the Messiah, uh, i I got to shift your attention as to where and how I'm going to fulfill my role as the Messiah. And this is where he goes on. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Now, Oftentimes, you know that Jesus has spoken um, kind of cryptically. He's, he's used parables and, and teachings that the disciples would have to ask about later, right? But here he says, hey, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to go. They're going to reject me. They're going to hate me. They're going to kill me. I'm going to rise again. And it says he spoke plainly about this. Like he didn't, it wasn't cryptic. He was, he was telling the truth, the perfect truth. And it's interesting. Peter took him aside 
and we began to rebuke him. Now that word rebuke is pretty intense. So like Jesus was raising his, or Peter was raising his voice at Jesus. Ah, like who wants to stand by Peter when he's doing that? Like, ooh. I mean, you're in a really wicked place and, and he fires off at Jesus. No way, Jesus, you're not gonna die. You're gonna take these people on. Let's take these people on. Let's take the Romans on. Let's set up shop. I mean, we can be cool. Like, I'll be your buddy. You can be the king and this will be great. James and John, they're gonna ask for the side, you know, side seats. But I wanna be close. Peter's not really liking the idea that Jesus is going to suffer. And in fact, most of the Jews at the time did not think that, the, that, that Jesus, the Messiah, was supposed to suffer. Now, there are plenty of passages in the Old Testament that say, oh, he's going to be rejected. He's going to die. Uh, he even says, he's going to come back. He's going to be in a tomb. He's going to come back. And we're going to know him. He's going to be famous. And, and eventually, after a lot of time, he's going to come back as the king and he's going to rule. But, but that's not the first time he comes. But they kind of thought... That would be the better way to do it. And so the, Peter, the rest of the Jews are saying, Jesus, no way. <laughs> you are not doing that. And, and this is how he, how he answers. Because I think, as it says, that, that Peter said, hey, hey, Jesus, come here, come here, come here. What are you thinking? No way. And so Jesus, he doesn't just say, be quiet. Remember who I am. He like calls over his buddy disciples. He turns to them and says, get behind me. Now, what's that about, right? Because that's sort of the place where disciples are supposed to be, right? Jesus would say, follow me. And so the disciples would kind of like get behind him and, and, and they would lead, he would lead them and they would follow him. And yet he says, hey, Peter, you're trying to lead me and that doesn't work. Get behind me. And what's the next word? Now, in that place where the gates of Hades are, and, and he's just said, I'm going to build my church here. The way I'm going to do it is by a sacrificial death. And, and Peter says, absolutely not. Get behind me. I mean, do you have any idea what it must feel for Peter at this point? I mean, Peter just heard, not probably a minute or two before, oh, Peter, son of Jonah. The Lord has revealed me to you. Oh, will you sit high upon this wonderful throne with me? Get behind me, Satan. Have you ever been in that position? Have you ever thought, you know what? That was a great moment. I just had a great moment with the Lord. And then not just a minute or two later, open mouth, insert foot. Have you ever been there? I mean, I, I'm sure you haven't as much as I have because I open my mouth too much. But um, I feel so good that I'm not alone in this, that I can go from being, at least in my mind, and hopefully in God's mind, you know, a saint, darn near a saint, and in the next moment, getting to the place where it's like, God is going, oh, what, what? But when Jesus says it to Peter, get behind me. You're my follower. You're my disciple. Get behind me. Satan. Now that's, and he said it to the side. Like he called him out in front of everybody. Wouldn't you hate to be called out in front of everybody? Especially that name. You don't have on your mind the things of God right now. You care more about yourself. And I think that sets up the whole next little phrase, which is kind of where I come to the point where it's like, I don't, like, I don't, I don't know if I can talk about this because it feels like I'm just posing. He's get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. You don't understand how I'm going to pull this off as the Messiah. You have a way that you want to do things. Your own agenda, your own way, the, the things of man. Because men go about seeking power and, and doing things in different ways than God does, right? And so the next phrase for me is like, because like I said, I've been to that place a few times. And, and the person I was with painted such an amazing picture of what was going on 
with the temple worship, with paying the goat God and what was going on with the goats and the people and the blood and the, I mean, just everything that was so disgusting. And I remember, I mean, this, like, plain as day, the first time I was there, we were up, like, so if you looked at the cave, there was a hill up, up to the right. And so he was up there and there were probably 40 of us with him. <clears throat> And, he, and there were lots of people, tourists, in this place, because it's kind of a tourist trap. And um, he got up there, and he yelled this. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And I went, oh, shut up. Because everybody, like, spun their head and turned. And I think that's what Jesus does here. Because it says he's not now talking just to the disciples. He called out to the crowd. So, like, Jesus, are you really going to talk to them about this? Because that's, that's kind of disgusting. You see what they're doing, right? I think, I think he was setting up his last line, actually, when he did that. He called to the crowd, if anyone wants to come up after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, interesting thing that he says about the cross. This is the first time we've ever seen this word in the Gospel of Mark. We're halfway through it that the cross is a part of this. He didn't even say that he was going to go to the cross when he told them, I'm going to go, they're going to reject me, they're going to kill me, and I'm going to rise after three days. He didn't even mention the cross yet. But here he talks about it. Now, it was funny because I was listening to this years ago, and I couldn't find out where it was. Uh, it was Francis Chan. He was talking about going out, and um, he wanted to spend some time alone with God and really just kind of discern God's will for his life. And I'm sure you've done that before. You've maybe just prayed and asked God, um, you know, what is it that you want me to do in this next phase of my life or whatever? And so uh, Francis, and he's a pastor out in California, he went and got like a, he went to a nice coffee shop and get a, got a blueberry muffin with that crumb stuff on the top, you know, like the big tops. It's like a muffin top and the muffin's really small, but it's got that crumbly stuff and that raw sugar that's so good, you know. Um, got one of those blueberry muffins and he got his favorite latte, you know, like vanilla latte with the whip and, you know, the little drizzle on top. And so he's got his blueberry muffin and he's got his latte and he's got his little blanket and he goes out because he lives in California. He goes to the beach and he lays out his beautiful blanket and he's got his little blueberry muffin and he's got his latte and he begins to pray, God, what is your will for my life? And he basically hears, well, it ain't this. <laughs> Haven't I said in my word to go find the poor and take care of them. Go find those who are hungry and feed them. And he's like, well, I, I got my blueberry muffin and my latte. And, and at that moment, he just said, what has my life in Christ become? And I was thinking about that because somebody sent me a funny picture about, um, and it, her phrase was, this is my picture or my rendition of Trendy Christian Girl. And so I found some pictures of Trendy Christian Girls you know, I love Jesus a latte. Isn't that cute? And uh, he restores my soul. Whatever's in this cup is going to restore my soul. I'm at my coffee shop, and it's wonderful, and I'm going to be here with Jesus. And, and, and then a uh, trendy Christian guy, I want to just pick on the girls, you know, got Jesus on my arm. That's me. I'm a follower of Jesus. I got him on my arm. Or I'm just sitting at the coffee shop. And now, this is horrible because literally that guy with more facial hair than I can grow, um, I have pictures that I've taken at a coffee shop. I actually looked on Facebook just this morning. It's like my Bible's laid open there. There's a, a, a commentary on Ephesians right here, but it's flipped over so you can just barely see the word Ephesians. And, and then my computer, you can only see half of it, but it's open to the Logos, you know, like um, study Bible thing. And my, uh, my One Hope pen is upside down, kind of like neatly placed upside down, half in. And then my glasses are, you know, because I'm really smart, and they're sitting there. And I thought, there I am, trendy Christian guy. Trying to say, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus. Look at my computer. Look at my commentary. Look at my Bible. Look at my really smart person glasses and my one hope pen that, you know, you have to have or else you're not a follower of Jesus. And then I thought of Jesus' line. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. And the picture of him looks different than trendy Christian girl or trendy Christian guy. Now, I don't know what that does to you, but for me, I think, I mean, there's, there's actually a curse word. Like, what the heck? 
am I doing following Jesus the way I'm doing it? When his call to me is so much different than I love Jesus a latte or Jesus on my arm. And like from that point on, I was like, the whole week is like, I don't know if I can talk anymore. Like at that point, it's like, okay, let's just stop and, and, and do a little reflection. Like Now, I know where some pastors would go at this point. Man, I could bring the heat right now. I could shame you and discourage you and, and beat you down until you walked out of here. I mean, crawled out of here on your bellies like a snake. I could do it. I mean, I got it in me. It's possible. I've heard it done a number of times. I don't think that's going to help, right? I could do like a... Um, this is horrible. Should I say his name? I could do a Joel Osteen thing and pump you up and make you excited. This is my Bible. And come on, let's go have the best life ever. But that's probably not going to help that much either. So I was wondering, like, what is the thing that actually helps people go from I love Jesus a latte to really carrying your cross on a regular basis, sacrificing who you are and what your agenda is so that you take up Christ's mission. I mean, like, do you got any, what are the things that have ever made you go from I love Jesus a latte to real Christianity? What are the things that have happened? I'm, I'm guessing, like in my life, it's, there have been certain people in my life, like real people, not just book people, although book people have done it too, there have been real people in my life that I've seen live out a different kind of sacrificial love to people where they kind of forgot themselves and they lived in such a way that, that they didn't care what people said about them. And I went, oh, I, I like that. Now, I, this is a, I don't know if it's a, if a gift or a curse, but I really don't care what you think of me. I, re- I just don't care. I, I got done caring when I was probably 35 or 40, and now I'm really old, and so I just don't care what you think of me. And that's a nice place to be. It really is. Um, I don't know if you're there yet. I don't know if, like, in your Christian walk, you still care about what people are saying about you. In fact, I met with a guy um, this past week who, who literally said, you know, I think I've been following Christ for a long time, but I never wanted to tell anybody about it because, like, following Jesus is kind of wimpy. And I went, okay, yeah, I was there, I was there with you once at, at a certain time. And then he said, but I don't care now. I, I just don't care what people think anymore. I'm telling everybody about what Jesus has done for me. And, and it was just like, okay, that's a, that's a shift, right? And, and I asked, well, what was it? And he said, well, I came to the worship night, you know, months ago, and there was somebody up here, uh, Candace, who was sharing her story about her brother being killed. And, um, and she said, I could, I, I could make a choice. I could, I could blame God or I could trust God that this was going to do something for someone. And that in the end, when it all panned out, I would understand why all this happened. Well, it's funny. I mean, today is it's kind of a weird day for me, right? It's uh, July 15th. It's my dad's birthday. So he died a year ago, two days ago. So he died on the 13th, two days shy of his 80th birthday. And my sister died on this day about eight years ago. So July, it's like this is a day where I, I kind of am thinking about death. Like I said, going to be an uplifting one today. We're going to. Um, but when Jesus says, and there's those three things, he says, deny yourself. What does that mean to deny yourself? What does it mean to take up your cross? What does it mean to follow him? Now, here's another thing from Francis Chan. It was really funny. He was talking about um, people who, who like the word of God. And, and so, you know, you would, like I could really take deny yourself. I could tell you what the Greek word means. Um, I, could, I could probably tell you, I could memorize, you know, the Greek passage that says, take up your cross. I could tell you what cross is in Greek. We could memorize it together. We could, we could sit around, like, um, we could sit around my fire pit in the backyard and talk about what it looks like or what it might look like to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. Or, or we could just do it. But here's what I think, and I think this is true in my own life. If I talk about it enough, with other Christians, like if I stand up here and talk about what it means to deny myself and to take up you know, Christ's cross and follow him, if I talk about it long enough, I'm really going to think that I'm doing it. I think I've even convinced myself of that. And maybe you have too. Well, yeah, I talk about it a lot. I've memorized the whole passage. 
in Greek. But then he goes on. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Now, he, he cannot be really talking about dying, right? No, no, I think actually he is. I think the idea of a cross and trying to save your life, and you know what it looks like to save your life, right? We do this all the time. We always try to save ourselves. We try to save our behinds. We try to make sure that we're okay. It's kind of the fight or flight thing. It's a a natural response. It's a fleshly natural response. It's only by the Spirit that we even have a chance of saying, no, no, I I give myself freely. It was interesting. I was talking to Josh before this, and I I said, you know, I really don't know. I I don't know where to land this. I don't know to, to, you know, put some heat on them or to like fire them up and do the cheerleader thing and raise my Bible high and everybody, woohoo. Um, and he reminded me of a book, that one of my favorite books, actually it is my favorite book called The Critical Journey. And it talks about how people go through stages in their spiritual life. Uh, stage one is kind of this acknowledgement that God exists and it might be the time when you actually come and trust in Jesus because you realize that he, he's real and he, he loves you and he's given his life for you. And so you start this journey by acknowledging that and, and trusting in him. And then you learn about God. And so there are things that you do. Oftentimes it's um, trendy Christian guy because you, ha- you got your tattoo and you got your right Bible and you go to the right place, which is Rust Belt, Rust Belt obviously. Um, and then you... You do all the good stuff, and you look like a Christian, and that's kind of one stage one, but then you realize that you can serve God. You can do things with the Holy Spirit and the gifts that he has given you, and so you start to serve, and you start realizing, oh, this is fun. God can use me. God is using me, but it's really about you. You know, it's about me, me. This is great. I can do this. It's me, and it's fun, and then you get to the point where that becomes dry, and And you start not wanting to do things for God, but you just want God alone. And that's a really important place to get to. When when all the things of God and the things he's given you become less important than God himself. And you go through this really difficult time called the inner journey. And, And in that moment, you go through what they call a wall. And this is written by lots of different authors You get to the point where you say, do I want all the things that God can give me or do I just want God? And when you get to the point where you just seek God and not his gifts, things shift. And it all of a sudden becomes more about him and less about you. And I don't know where you're at. I don't know where I'm at. I mean, I know where I've been at certain times, but like even now, I'm not sure where. I'm at. I know I don't care what people think, so I think I'm on the right track. So you come out of that inner journey to an outer journey, a place where you're serving people, but it's not any longer about you and what God is doing through you. It's just God, what God is doing. And then it says that you move to the last place, is the life of love, where you have surrendered everything to God, and you basically say, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Because it's about you and not me. It doesn't matter. I don't matter. I don't have to survive this. And at that point, oftentimes, people don't survive. They give up their life. Now, if you're in stage three, that's petrifying. But if you're at stage six, you think, that's the most natural thing to do. Jesus, in fact, has called me to that. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? How many of you... think that you're gaining the whole world and yet you might be a little concerned for your soul or what can a man give in exchange for his soul and this is the last one and I think this is why Jesus turned to the crowds and yelled out if anyone comes after me deny yourself take up your cross and follow me it says if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation and they would have been looking at that they would have been seeing that If anyone is ashamed of me in that point, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And I think at that point, the disciples went, oh my gosh, I'm so far away. I have so far to go. And that's what I would say about myself. It's like, I have so far to go. I want to get to the point where no matter what is going on, I would gladly give up my life. 
and it would bring no shame, but instead it would bring honor to God. Is that where you're at? Like there was a point where I was like, I was going to have candles. We were going to do vows. We were gonna, I was going to have nails. We were gonna, you know, it's like, but I just, I just don't know what that is for you. When you read the scriptures, you go, I think Jesus is calling us to something that's far different than many of us. And I would say this about myself, that, that I'm right now surrendering to him. But I don't know where you're at. So I'm going to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you. And I'm going to ask that you would ask him to see what is the next step. What is the next thing that you need to surrender to him? Heavenly Father, more than anything else, we want to build our lives around the love that you've shown to us and the love that you are asking us to show to others. It is a sacrificial love. It is a love that empties itself. It is a love that goes to the cross for us.